Happy Holidays, everyone! Welcome to the TCS Gaming Holiday Special. 2017 is quickly coming to an end, and it was a very good year for video games. Despite it being a good year, though, I really didn't play that many new games this year. In fact, now that I think about it, I probably played more new games in 2016 than I did in 2017. Which is why, rather than doing a top 10 games that came out in 2017 list, I'm going to be doing a top 10 games I played in 2017 list. For a game to make it onto this list, I have to have played it for the first time in 2017. So just to be clear, the game does not have to be released in 2017, I just have to play it for the first time in 2017. So grab yourself a warm blanket, maybe a cup of hot cocoa, and let's celebrate another year of existence together. Also, I got to 500 subscribers. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I know, I know. Zelda's only at number 10, but if you put down your metaphorical torches and pitchforks, I'll explain the reason that it's here. Zelda is at number 10 because I am a bad fan. I have not finished this game. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. I get it. Shut up! Despite not yet finishing Breath of the Wild, the amount of time I've played I felt was enough to still have a good opinion of it. Breath of the Wild is packed with content in this huge rendition of Hyrule. The world is absolutely massive, but it never seems like a chore to explore because there's always stuff to do. Bringing Zelda to an open world setting seemed to be the right thing to do, and they managed to do it while keeping the staples of Zelda games we all know and love, while also adding in more standard open world tropes like cooking and open-endedness. I mean, after you get the paraglider, you're just released into this massive world, and you can go anywhere and do anything. I only finished one-fourth of the actual game because I was too busy doing, well, anything. Attacking enemy bases, creating new cuisine, defeating an ice dragon. The reason I didn't finish the game was because I was enthralled with discovering brand new things to do. It also came out at a bad time for me because I had very little time to sit down and play it. Trust me, I will finish this game at some point. Is that good enough? I guess it wasn't. I was surprised at just how much fun I had with Steep. If I could compare it to any game, I would say it's like SSX, but more realistic and with a wingsuit. Steep is a pretty simple game. There are six different types of challenges that you unlock by exploring the mountains. Nothing is really that complex about it, but what makes it unique to me is the online play. Messing around on these virtual mountain ranges with friends is so much fun. You feel a real sense of camaraderie whenever everyone in your group completes a challenge, and you also share the sense of frustration when you find a challenge that's near impossible. While these challenges can get a tad repetitive, there are just enough differences in each of them to keep you coming back for more. The gameplay and controls do a good job of setting boundaries within the game to keep the realistic nature it was going for, while still keeping the idea that you are playing a game. I mean, I don't think you would willingly snowboard around huge chunks of ice or attempt to fly through a thicket of trees with a wingsuit. Otherwise, something like this might happen. Showing off your new gear is another reason to play with friends. As you can see, I'm a panda, because I'm a furry. I'm just kidding. I'll tell you what though, Steep nails the atmosphere. The fresh white powder, the snowy forest, the beautiful views from the top of the mountains, and the icy wind blowing. I highly suggest that you take a good look around when you play Steep, just to see the great attention to detail. Or you could just crash into a rock. Star Fox! No, no, not Star Fox Zero. More like Star Fox Zero out of five. I don't know, I never played it. Star Fox! No, no, not the one with the dinosaurs. Star Fox! Yeah, there we go, Star Fox 64. I gotta say, that I never understood why people love this game so much. I mean, it never really seemed like it had much depth, it seemed so simple. And that's exactly what it is. It has a pick up and play nature and replayability because it's such a quick burst of space shooting goodness. The simplicity of the flying and shooting is what makes this game what it is. It's not overly complicated. The flying and shooting mechanics are easy to understand. Each level plays nearly the same, but the visuals change and make each area feel unique without taking away from the simple gameplay. 
And yet, Star Fox 64 still has that extra layer because of its multiple pathway system. Each pathway requires finishing the previous level in a different way. It totally increases the replay value because you want to see those other levels, and the extra bosses, and the secret ending. And that's really all there is to say about it. It's a simple fun space shooter. With Peppy. Sometimes I like to chat with some people in my Discord server. It's normally a fun time until a bunch of people join and it ends up sounding like this. But one of the people in here is one of my YouTube friends, Zarbok. Barzok once scrolled through my channel looking for my least viewed review. It turns out that it was my Dishonored video, which made me realize that no one seems to care for this franchise like I do. Another thing that my buddy Kobzar likes to do is make me fake thumbnails, like this one. Jesus Christ. I'm kind of cheating with this choice because I actually started to play this game last year, but I didn't finish it until this year, so technically it's okay? Yeah, I'm a cheater. Dishonored 2 is a damn good stealth game. It keeps in the aspects of the original game that I loved, like the multiple ways of playing, supernatural powers, and various side activities, but it also adds on to this gameplay even further, giving you even more options. For example, you can play as Corvo, who functions similarly to how he did in the first game, or you can tackle the adventure as Emily, who has a completely different skill set. The gameplay being largely the same as the first game means the new areas and missions are where the game differentiates itself from the original. I loved exploring the various floors of the Atomire Institute by climbing the elevator shaft, and Jindosh's mansion's mechanical moving floors made navigating the building an intricate puzzle. I did notice that Dishonored 2 is significantly more difficult to ghost because the enemies seem to be a lot smarter, which is why it took me so long to beat it. But Dishonored 2 is a great stealth game and one that I wish more of my subscribers cared about. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon are on here solely because I wanted to talk about Gen 7. I don't even really care about the Ultra games. I haven't even finished this game yet. Pokemon Sun and Ultra Sun and Moon is a great addition to the Pokemon series. I put over 100 hours into Gen 7 in like two weeks, so I guess you could say that I enjoyed it. I liked the setting, the new Pokemon, and the new additions. Gen 7 changed up the way the game progresses a little by taking out gyms and replacing them with the island trials. I thought this was a neat idea to keep the game fresh, and each trial has a different method of completing it, keeping it unique and interesting. Although I did find myself missing some of the more intense battles the gym leaders gave me. The Kahunas really didn't do it. Maybe in Gen 8 they can mix the gym system and trials or something. The new roster of Pokemon was pretty solid overall. I loved using Pokemon like Araquanid, Salazzle especially, and the majestic steed Mudsdale. And Rowlet, of course. I picked Litten for this most recent playthrough, and Hal picked a Rowlet, and I actually found myself getting jealous that Rowlet was with Hal and not me. Cause, I mean, look at that face! Who wouldn't want that? The Alolan forms were another idea I liked a lot, and it should be expanded upon in future games. And Alola itself was a pretty fun region to explore. The different areas were varied and interesting. You can go from a beach, to a jungle, and then to a volcano, all on the same island. So yeah, Pokemon Sun and Ultra Sun and Moon. It's number six. Sonic Forces is a game that... <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't even get through that. I wish that I could put Sonic Forces on this list, but the game simply isn't that good. So instead, I'm gonna talk about Sonic Mania. Even as a modern Sonic guy, I can say that Mania is the best Sonic game in years and it's not even close. It blends together old ideas from the classic games with fresh new ideas from the different minds of the people who made it. Oh yeah, this ain't Sonic Team, baby. They were off making a four hour long snore fest with more cutscenes than gameplay. Five fucking years to make this shit, are you kidding me? Mania does do a bit of nostalgia pandering by bringing back old stages, again, but these stages have differences in the design and are extremely fun to play. But for my money, I'll take these new original stages any day. Seriously, the level design, the set pieces, the visuals, and the goddamn beautiful music all made my heart sing. I was actually mesmerized by some of these levels, like Mirage Saloon and Press Garden Act 2. I mean, look at that! It's beautiful! It's the pinnacle of 16-bit graphical achievement! Can we just make these new guys Sonic Team? Like, for the rest of time, please. Like, we don't need the old guys anymore. Let's at least agree to let these guys continue the classic Sonic series, because this might just be the best classic Sonic game that there is. Besides Sonic 4, of course. That's the game of the year. You know what? Number one is Sonic 4. Cancel the rest of the list. 
Sonic 4. I like Crash Bandicoot. My favorite is, uh, it's the one with the Titans. Mmm, yeah, look at that. True Splash Bandaboob gameplay. But if you want to play a game that doesn't suck, then you should play Crash Insane Trilogy. I can't express how excited I was to see Crash back in action. I remember Crash from when I was a kid, and they seriously got this remake right. They fixed most of the issues with the original games, and kept the good from those games as well. And they definitely didn't screw up the jet ski controls. Oh, okay, they, they definitely fucked that up, but I swear everything else has improved. They polished up the things that needed fixing, like the hit detection, camera, Crash 1's control, Crash 1's save system, Crash 1's gem system, ba basically a lot of Crash 1 fixing. They made everything precise and accurate. I never question if I should have made a jump or not. When I die, I know it's my fault. The game still has that Crash Bandicoot difficulty, but I never feel cheated because of poor control or collision detection like I would in the old games at times. The graphical upgrade is obviously the thing that everyone notices first, and it looks so damn good. They fixed the main lighting issues I had, and everything just pops with vibrancy and charm. Visuals and audio are absolutely fantastic, which was the main point of the remaster, but it's all still here. Now I just sit and hope for a brand new Crash game. But mostly for Jack 4. Please. Please. Not often do I play the first game in a new franchise, not really like it, and then come back and play the sequel. That is exactly what happened with Titanfall 2. The first game was the standard modern EA bullshit. Decent but buggy multiplayer, with little to no campaign. I had no reason to believe that the second game in the series would be any different. I was dead fucking wrong. I don't think I have played a better futuristic shooter in my life. In fact, I would even say Titanfall 2 has one of the best FPS campaigns, period. The shooting mechanics, which are pretty standard, aren't the main focus of Titanfall 2. It uses its best features to their fullest potential. The advanced movement system is buttery smooth, and the level design is perfect for it. It's not about posting up and shooting waves of enemies, but rather cleverly maneuvering your way around these huge areas and taking down the opposition using the least amount of ammo possible. Each mission brings in new mechanics that are simple to learn and fun to use, like the time switcher or the cranes. They also improved the titan combat and made it easy to understand the basics, but mastering these titans takes more practice and you are rewarded from playing the game more. On top of all this, the story and world building was surprisingly good, and I got way more invested than I thought I would. The multiplayer plays second fiddle here, but that doesn't mean it's not fun. The weapons are all fun to use, the game modes are all different, and playing with friends is an absolute blast. If you overlook this game like I did, do yourself a favor and pick it up. You will not be disappointed. I hope they continue with what made Titanfall 2 so great in Titanfall 3. Wait, what? what is, what is this? No, 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 EA. EA, please, please don't fuck it up. Number two is Bioshock Infinite, which is great and all. But before we get to that, I just have one thing to say. 2K Games, if you're watching, and I know you are, it's been five years since the last Bioshock game came out. I know you've been busy making sports games, but if you could just extend an olive branch to us Bioshock fans, I and so many others would really appreciate that. In fact, one might even call it a Christmas miracle. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Oh my god, get a fucking haircut. I hate the fact that it took me five years to play this game. Bioshock Infinite does everything an FPS game should, adds a little bit more, and gives it that Bioshock style. Infinite is a little bit more action heavy than the first two games with larger areas and faster gunplay, but it will still put you in those uncomfortable positions where you know something's going to happen at any moment and then BAM! George Washington with wings. The two-handed combat system is still as great as it ever was and mixing weapons and powers together is the best way to fight. The various weapons are all fun to use and as usual the name of the game is upgrading them and conserving ammo. But everybody knows all this stuff. What Bioshock does best is world building and atmosphere and Bioshock Infinite is no different. I might not understand anything about the plot, but Columbia is the perfect setting for a Bioshock game. It's highly focused on a cult as well as a political struggle, and because Booker DeWitt doesn't want any part of it, he ends up becoming a big part of it. It deals with heavy-hitting subjects like racism and rebellion, and you will get invested in this world. 
Infinite is a bit more action heavy like I said before, but it doesn't forget that it's Bioshock. It'll screw with your head. Unexpected things will happen and you will have to figure out how to deal with these problems. And I don't know how it does this, but this game will put you on edge. You are never comfortable. And that's something that hasn't really been replicated since in any FPS I've played. So, 2K, I beg of you, don't forget about Bioshock. Come on, you know what it is. I think Mario Odyssey is already my favorite Mario game. There wasn't another game I played this year with the amount of thought that was put into this game. Everything in Mario Odyssey is almost perfectly made. The controls, the levels, the enemies, the minigames, and especially the new takeover mechanic. Being able to control other beings opens up the levels to so many different possibilities because each of those beings has different abilities that you can use to collect the various power moons around the levels. On top of the sheer number of things to control, they managed to make it so easy to understand how to use them all. Not once did I spend more than 30 seconds trying to figure out how to control an enemy I captured because all of them use one button for their abilities. Having this many gameplay styles can make some games frustrating because the player can be overwhelmed when trying to figure out how to use them all. But Odyssey executes this perfectly by just keeping it simple. The level design in this game is some of the best in any platformer I've ever played. Each of them is jam-packed with things to do. Every challenge feels unique and different because of the capture abilities. I was never bored while playing this game. Each new area you go to, every corner you turn has something fresh and new. Everything is compact, and yet there is so much to explore in each section of the levels, like in Luncheon Kingdom when you get to this area. In this small space, you can do a long jump on the pillars for a moon here, throw turnips in the soup for a moon here, jump around on the building for some purple coins, land back on the ground, go into this house, and play a minigame for another moon here, and that's just a small fraction of the actual level. Replayability in these levels is also massive. Coming to revisit the levels after you initially finish them opens up a ton of new challenges to complete. It only takes 120 moons to get to Bowser, but there are 830 moons total. 830? The 120 moons needed were already enough for a great experience for me. That just shows how much content is packed into this game. My favorite part of this game is how smoothly it plays. The platforming control is so good and mastering the way Mario maneuvers is one of the most fun parts of the game. He can triple jump, high jump, long jump, wall jump, spin jump, pretty much all of his standard abilities are here, as well as the brand new mechanics that come with Cappy. Cappy adds different attacks like the hat throw or spin throw, but it also adds more options when platforming. You can jump up, throw your hat, dive, land on your hat again, make some food, do your laundry, pet your dog before you finally land. Mario Odyssey has everything you want from a platformer, and that is why it is my favorite game that I played this year. This has been Trey from TCS Gaming. See you next time. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, then click that like button. Or if you're new, you can even subscribe. First things first, I want to give a big shout out to both Salmon for drawing my channel art and also Jack's Gaming Zone for providing the Pokemon footage you saw in this video. This will be the final video I post this year, so I just want to say thank you for another great year. And also thank you guys for 500 subscribers. This is the 500 subscriber video after all. And also thank you guys for 600 subscribers because I'm perpetually late for everything in my life. Anyways, guys, take care, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.